Hi there. Uh, in this video, I want to first just define a little bit about what we mean when we talk about a model in physics. This is our first model that we're building. And then I want to talk specifically about one of the tools of using this model called uh, motion map. So what we've done is we have built our first model is what I call the constant velocity particle. Uh, and when I talk about a model in science, I don't necessarily mean like a little physical thing that I glue together that looks like a bigger thing. Um, but a model is just a representation of our ideas. Um, and so we're looking at a relationship between position and time uh, for a moving thing. And that is what is leading us into this first model. And our models are always subject to changing because they're based on our evidence. And so if our evidence changes, then we have to change our model or we're not dealing with reality anymore. Um, we have evidence that a toy car moved uh, where we got a straight line on the position versus time graph. And defining the slope of that graph to be velocity, um, which tells us both how fast it's moving and what direction it's moving, a uh, positive slope is moving forwards on a number line, a negative slope is moving backwards on a number line, moving to lower numbers. Uh, but with a straight line graph, the slope's always the same. So if the velocity is the slope, then on a straight line graph, the velocity is always the same because it is the slope. So as far as we can tell, that was true for the toy car. It might turn out later that there's a detail that we missed. Maybe we'll see in some way that that's not really the whole story. But for now, the evidence that we have suggests that this is true for the toy car. Um, and so we're gonna just look at what I can do with this model, as long as that model keeps on working for us, as long as it keeps on making correct predictions about nature, then we keep on using it. And when we find ways that the model isn't sufficient, then we have to revise our thinking. And as long as the model works, then we use it. And if the model doesn't work, then we don't use it. So different ways that we can represent this model. Um, all four of these ways of representing a model are really, really, really important to me. Um, people who are inexperienced in physics expect that it's all that fourth one, mathematical, but no, um, all four of these are equally meaningful and important to me. Um, and skipping straight ahead to like, I'm going to solve a bunch of math is really not the best way for us to do our best physics. Um, so ways to represent that model first verbal, it's exactly what it sounds like. We're just using our words to explain what is happening. Um, the one I want to focus on right now is the pictorial representation, what I call a motion map. This is new for us. Uh, we'll deal with the others in a different video but a motion map. Let's imagine that I have a toy car that moves forwards 20 centimeters each second. Um, and let's say that it drips oil. Just bear with me. The car drips oil, one drop of oil onto the ground every single second. So if you looked after the car had driven across the tabletop or whatever, then we would see those little droplets of oil. And those little droplets of oil would show uh, places where the car has been. And I'm just going to make a dot to represent then uh, like where the car was when it dropped its little droplet of oil. I have here, I have a number line representing position in centimeters. Um, there are numbers here. Now, if somebody else has already constructed a number line and you're stuck using their number line, okay, I guess. Um, but if we're just thinking about some situation and we're working out this problem on our own, well, like if there's no pre-existing number line, then we're free to put the zero of that number line wherever we want. We would also be free, I'm not going to do it in this video, but we would be free if we felt like it to make our number line increase going to the left. And I know from math classes, you're not used to that, but we could do it. And sometimes I do when I'm solving problems. We can talk more about that later but I can put the zero of my number line wherever I like. So let's say if the car started here at this red dot, then maybe it's simpler for me if I just say, you know what, I'm just gonna make the zero 
the place where the car started, because it's nice to start from zero. It's nice to have zero in my math. Um, so I'm going to say that the zero position is where the car started. So when my stopwatch reads zero seconds, then right there, that red dot is where the car was. Now, if it moves forwards 20 centimeters each second, then one second later, the next droplet of oil is at the 20 centimeter mark on my number line, and the next droplet of oil is at the 40 centimeter mark. We'll pretend that these are lined up exactly right to left. I'm getting the up, down, a little bit off, but you get the idea, I would hope. So every 20 centimeters, I'm just making a new dot to represent where was this car after each one second. Now, if we just look at these dots, like if these are oil droplets on the ground afterwards, then just seeing a set of dots, like you can't tell if this car started at the zero centimeter mark and went to the right, or if it started at the, uh, let's see, 120, one, at the 160 centimeter mark, then went to the left. You can't tell. So we should add a little bit more detail onto this motion map. So what I would like to do is I would also like to represent the velocity of this toy car at each one of these dots. Then I just want to show a little arrow on each dot. And I just want to show that each one of these dots, uh, I, I'm showing the velocity. This car is moving to the right with some velocity. Now, each one of these dots, our car, this is the constant velocity particle model, and we're thinking that the car is always moving with the same velocity, then all of these arrows should be identical arrows. So I'm going to make a bunch more arrows. And so each of these are all identical length arrows. And now I'm showing not just the, where the car was, but I'm also showing the velocity that that car had at each of those moments. And now it's a whole lot clearer where uh, it's a whole lot clearer that the car was moving from left to right, which we wouldn't notice if we were just looking at the dots themselves without those little velocity arrows. So one thing I want to uh, come back to is this idea of a particle model. We don't need to care about the size or shape of this toy car. It doesn't really affect how did this car move. And so we could imagine just like shrinking that car down in our minds to existing just like at one little point. And so this is why we call it the particle model. Like a particle is something that's so tiny it doesn't have a size or shape for us to care about. So as long as the object is all moving together, then we can use this particle model where we don't have to worry about like, well, what about the headlights? What about the rear bumper? What about the driver's seat? We don't need to care about that. We just think about it as a singular blob. One last thing that I like to add onto my motion maps is uh, is a way of keeping track of time. When was the car at this spot? When was the car at this spot? Like you might look at this red dot at the 80 centimeters and think that's the fifth dot. So since the car was dripping oil every second, the fifth dot, that's a time of five seconds. But we'd actually be wrong about that because our very, very first dot is going to happen when the stopwatch reads zero seconds. So zero seconds is this time, one second is the next dot. Two seconds is the next dot, three seconds, four seconds, five seconds. So zero, one second, two seconds, three seconds, four seconds. The fifth dot is a time of four seconds because we started at zero seconds. Um, and so I find it useful sometimes to just write on there, uh, like write a number, maybe not even like the S for seconds, but like zero, one, two, three, 
just to help me keep track of when was the car at that spot. Now, the standard choice is to go like one dot each second, but we could also imagine that maybe this car dropped a, a drop of oil every two seconds. And so maybe we could make each dot be separated by two seconds. And the standard choice then is one second. Uh, you can do a different number of seconds from one dot to the next dot. Um, just make sure that you write down um, how much time it is between dots. So this is how we make a motion map. Um, I uh, One last thing that I want to add to this, when I'm drawing these by hand, we know that all of my little black velocity arrows on here are equal amounts because I just copied the arrows. But when I'm drawing by hand, I don't always know for sure that my arrows are exactly equal length. So if I want to make sure that I'm indicating, hey, these are all equal lengths, then we can steal a trick from geometry class, like to show in geometry, to show that like two line segments are equal lengths, then we just like put a little hash mark across them. And so I could do that same thing with uh, these arrows where I just put a little hash mark. Where, and these are small, so what I'm trying to show here is to show that, say, these two arrows are the same length, which might not be obvious when I'm drawing by hand, then I just put a hash mark and a hash mark. And if maybe later on my car was moving at a different, a different velocity, then, and I draw a shorter arrow to try to indicate a lower velocity, I would draw a longer arrow to indicate a larger velocity. And so if I want to show that this short arrow is not the same length as my first ones, then I just use like a different number of hash marks to show, hey, this is a different amount. This longer arrow, I'd use a different number of hash marks to show, hey, this is a different amount. So there's our first introduction to making motion maps. I hope that that was helpful for you. I'll see you soon.